Hi, you're watching In the Studio here in the DC TV studios at Davis Media Access. My name's Autumn Labbe Renault, and I'm hosting this segment. Be sure to tune in weekdays at 10 a.m. to see other segments in addition to this on DC TV Channel 15 on the Comcast system. You can also catch the replays on Menu 99 on AT&T's UVerse system. And be sure to check out our whole archive online at dctv davismedia.org. Uh, my pleasure today to have two of our Davis City Council members with us today, and we're going to be talking about a proposed renter's ordinance. So let me welcome Davis City Council members Brett Lee and Lucas Frerix. Welcome. Ah, thank yeah. you. Thanks so much for having uh, us. Yeah, so this interview came about, Brett, when you were in here recording your Meet the Candidate statements. We talked about this for quite a while, and you were really passionate about it, and it kind of got me intrigued sure. um, that we have some real issues here in Davis. I think it starts with an incredibly low vacancy rate. So what can you tell me about that? Yeah, so the vacancy rate's less than 1%. It's sort of been estimated at anywhere from 0.3% to 0.5%. Yeah. So, you know, in either case, far below 1%. And so um, the very low vacancy rent creates a dynamic where there's an imbalance, uh, kind of a, a market imbalance in terms of the, the normal power of a renter versus uh, the apartment owners. And some in some sense, but there's actually a variety of reasons why I think a renter's ordinance is needed over and above the fact that there's a small vacancy rate. Okay, well, let's take those in turn. So the where the renter's ordinance really came from was from my neighborhood association, the Oste Manor Neighborhood Association. And what was happening was there were certain houses that were known as sort of party houses. Mm -hmm. So we live in the neighborhood where uh, you know, the, the pirate house is. Right. And then, you know, so these houses would sort of be handed down from student to student. And so it could be the party house or it could be the volleyball player's house. And, and the neighbors or, you know, most everyone there sort of works. And so on Wednesday night at uh, 1 a.m. when there's these crazy parties going on, you know, you try it a few times where you'll go and, you know, try to be polite. Hey, can you turn the music down? And when it's this sort of ongoing recurring problem, you know, what do you do next? Right, and right. so the, the city had some tools to deal with it, but not that many. And really what happened was it just uh, really degraded the quality of life for the neighbors. And so what a couple neighbors did, um, Vince Sterla and Daniel Boone, is they started looking at other university towns. They mm -hmm. looked at Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Barbara, uh, Berkeley, uh, San Luis Obispo, and they s looked at what their rental ordinances were doing, and um, they got some ideas from that, and they sort of started working on it. And about that time, I, um, st well, I was involved with it, and then I eventually I was on the council. Mm -hmm. And so the past couple of years, I've been working on on it on the council, and uh, I've been joined with uh, Lucas to mm -hmm. help yeah. kind of shape it and then get it to the point where it's we think that it's ready to be voted on. And this is something you're hoping to bring later this spring. Um, Actually, in uh, two weeks. In two weeks. Yeah. yeah. So, so very it's soon. the May seventeenth. Uh, seventeenth. Okay. Yep. It's on the, yeah. the council agenda. All right. So what are some of the problems experienced? You talked a little bit about the problems experienced by neighbors, but what, what kind of things might renters experience too where this ordinance would benefit them? Yeah, there, there's a real need for sort of the, uh, you know, sort of ombudsman sort of approach, right? Where an ability where folks, uh, you know, who have uh, issues with their experiencing in their apartments or their or their house that they're renting, uh, when they're in, in some cases have landlords that are not very responsive and mm -hmm. may in fact in many cases be out of town and not, not nearby or not very responsive to their needs. So uh, there's an example of a couple of undergraduates that I am aware of uh, that live in South Davis earlier this year when we had the, quite a bit of rainy weather, uh, they had experienced uh, the sort of the buckling of their ceiling, right, mm -hmm. uh, in, their ba in their bathroom. Uh, it started to, water just started pouring through. Um, the, 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 um, the management that, uh, for the uh, apartment they were in was not responsive uh, very much at all. It took them a long while to actually get some results and to get someone in there to actually work on fixing it. And this is actually in addition to uh, the same apartment not having a working front door lock um, for over well over a month as well. So, uh, you know, th there, this is a, and 
I don't, I'm not sure that it's, you know, universal problem in Davis, certainly, mm -hmm. but we, I think it's definitely more, it happens more often than we're uh, aware of. And, and I think a lot of students just sort of also put up with some of these issues and they right. don't necessarily, they don't, there's no necessary, there's no real resource for them to go to, uh, you know, at this, you know, in sort of one organized way to come to the city and say, hey, this, we're having issues here and, and how to and seek sort of remedy for that and also some sort of resources to help assist them. So I imagine important. also with such a low vacancy rate that there might be some fear about um, if I make waves, if I report things, where yeah. am I going to live? Yeah, Absolutely. So, so, you know, that, that brings up an important point. So where I think the vacancy rate really creates this issue is if I know there are, and there are, 10 people waiting in line for the apartment right. that I'm living in, I don't want to make too many waves. So when I complain and something isn't done, there are, there are some regulations that apply uh, statewide mm -hmm. and also some county health regulations. But they ultimately assume that there's this, uh, their one path is to move out. Like, well, if the landlord's not cooperative, then you can move out. Or at some level, you complain if there's something, um, there are a couple items, you have to have a working toilet. Mm -hmm. Right, so. Um, That's health code, right? <clears throat> it is, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But the, the remedy there, <clears throat> so the example I give is uh, you've got a group of students. There's eight of us living in a three bedroom, two bath home. Which is a common scenario. Sure. Yeah. And uh, one of the toilets doesn't work anymore. And you let the landlord know, hey, the toilet doesn't work. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll get there, right? I mean, because sometimes, I mean, some. So this is not to throw all the landlords under the bus. There no, are some no, apartment no, complexes some. and some single family residential yeah. rentals. They are really on top of things. They run a very uh, good operation. Absolutely. You call and complain or point something out, they're there very quickly within a day or two, making the repairs and everything kind of moves forward. But a lot of times, especially with the single family rentals, you know, anecdotally, we have people who kind of might own a home in Davis, but they live in Boston mm -hmm. and then, you know, they try to rent it remotely and they're not really professionals and they try to save a little money on property management. So, okay, one toilet's out. Well, I'll get the plumber out there. You know, a week later, it's not working. Okay. And then the second toilet goes out. Well, now we can actually do something. As long as you have a working toilet, they're not really in violation of any sort of state laws. Once the second toilet goes out, there is a requirement that you have a working toilet. It's a safety issue. It's mm -hmm. a health, health issue. But the remedy is you let the county know, and the county condemns the property as uninhabitable. So imagine you're a student. You're you know, just finishing up midterms and getting right. ready for finals. And now what do you do? Do you really want to go to the county, complain that your apartment or house is uninhabitable, and then have to go find somewhere to live. So major life disruption, yeah, right. potentially. Right, and, and then there's, there's sort of lower tier things. So imagine your oven doesn't work. Right. Well, you know, I don't know. Do people really cook in ovens? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but it's out and three weeks later it's still out, five weeks later it's still not working, and you're like, well, what should I do? Right. Do you really complain? And then the landlord will then say, well, you're kind of a complainer, so I'm gonna not renew your lease, and then someone right. else can move in. Yeah. So there, there's kind of a variety of things, and you know the city's not trying to micromanage the rental relationship, but have some basic reasonable standards, and also basic set the basic expectations for the landlord, for the renter, and also for the neighbor. I mean, that's one of the nice things about this, is there's components which address the neighbor's concerns, mm -hmm. yeah, sort of rights and responsibilities, <coughs> uh, landlords, rights and responsibilities, and also the tenants. The tenant, yeah. Okay. And, um, yeah, it's you know, a nice I, balance between all three. Yeah. yeah. So, so how would it work? I mean, what what does the you, those are some of the things it covers. But how would it work? How would it be funded? Yeah. Who would be the players in it? So there's a couple of components. Um, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about it. Maybe uh, Lucas can fill Great. in some of the details. So part of it is just an information resource. Mm -hmm. So, so landlords would register their properties, and they'd be required to. And as part of that, they would pay a, a fee. For multifamily residences, so apartment complexes, okay. the maximum fee would be, what we're proposing is $100 a year for the entire property. So if it's a 75 unit apartment complex or you know, 200 unit apartment complex, it's still just $100 a year Total. for the entire yeah. complex. And not per unit, it's and that's not an important distinction. Yeah, okay. that, so it's very modest. Right. And for single family residential rentals, 
and actually as a, an aside, about a third of the single family residential units, homes, mm -hmm. in Davis are rentals. Mm -hmm. So I mean it's a very, very large S chunk significant of number. number of homes. But that would be set at $25. And the reason the prices are relatively low is the biggest piece is consolidating a lot of information. So if you're a landlord and your tenant's not behaving as you think they should or you're right. concerned about you know, landlord, uh, what your landlord is doing, you can have this one-stop shop, which would be a website, which would have that information, and then also just a little kiosk at City Hall. And so there's nothing like this in place right now. Correct. Currently. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's all very disparate. I mean there there are tiny bits here and there, but they're all you have to really go search for everything, right? Mm -hmm. On your own and know where to search. Mm -hmm. And both as neighbors and also as tenants and or landlords. So uh, it's um, very important to sort of make this one stop shopping sort of system. So we have everything sort of that clearing house for all of this information right. to be together uh, in one place. You know, uh, resources for uh, you know where to find housing and for the first place resources for uh, for folks uh, dealing with code enforcement issues, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, things that need, might need to be addressed there. So uh, all of that coming together under sort of one city umbrella web website will be very helpful. Uh, Dispute resolution as well? Absolutely. Yeah. The, yeah. You know, the city actually, that's a big part of it, I think. The city years ago <clears throat> had uh, a, a mediation service uh, set up. I remember. Uh, yeah, and it was a city-funded program for a right. long, long time. Well, during the depths of the Great Recession, um, the city cut that program. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it was and it was actually a very good program, but but the funds were just not there to sort of continue to sustain it, uh, and, and we had to you know take a look at you know many different types of programs and how to restructure. But out of the cutting of that program, a new nonprofit has actually formed here in Yolo County, the Yolo Conflict Resolution Center. Okay. And so there, uh, this website that will be sort of under the city's umbrella uh, will will have d you know direct contact and work with the Yolo Conflict Resolution Center to help connect folks for those types of services, some dispute resolution, mediation type services between tenants and landlords or, or whomever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that would be the the second sort of piece. So the first piece is just providing that information. The second is that, that resource. So before, like right now, if you have a dispute, really it sort of leads to small claims court. Mm -hmm. That's the only path. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. And so this would be the sort of intermediate step, and more people would be able to take it. And the Sacramento Rental Housing Association said they would provide some training for the mediators. So they would be really up on what the tenant landlord law is. Mm -hmm. So these aren't people just trying to reach an agreement for agreement's sake. They will actually be a good resource and say, hey, this is what the law is. And so, hey, I think your expectations are out of line. Or, right. wow, your expectations are in line. How come you guys aren't uh, you know, working together on right. this? And so there's the information piece. And that mediation piece is very important mm -hmm. because sometimes it can be between roommates, right? Mm -hmm. I am on the name on the lease. You move in, and you're supposed to pay me five hundred dollars, right. and you didn't pay. But yeah. uh, you were gone, you know, visiting your friend, and and there's this little squabble, and it just sort of, right. you know, all the roommates are going, "Whoa, what's going on? What right. do we do?" Yeah, just having a mediator just to sit with yeah. and go, "Oh, okay. Well, that seems like we could probably do that." We're down to our last couple of minutes, so I, I do sure. want to ask, what are you hearing out there in terms of support or any concerns about the proposal? So I was going to say we've we've had a lot of conversations with folks. I mean, yeah. in the you know community, neighborhood groups certainly, but also um, <clears throat> you know we had major conversations with a lot of the landlords themselves, yeah. particularly the big sort of uh, you know apartment landlords right. that were the big complexes and things, tandem properties and mm -hmm. other folks. Um, and you know they're they're cautiously optimistic. You know that we're we're sort of going in the right direction. I mean, they, were, they were really concerned. They did not want to see a fee you know, assessed on an individual apartment unit, basis, yeah. right? And they also, and I think this is a very valid concern and something that we've really worked to address is you know, they don't want also the assumption that everybody is sort of guilty <laughs> from the beginning, right? This right. is supposed to be uh, to help solve problems, right? So when there are issues that arise, we can actually address those as opposed to assuming that everybody is sort of falling into this category uh, with that there are issues that, that, need, to be, that need to be fixed. So, right. yeah. so so there's, there's one other important piece to this. And so apartments are purpose built for rental activity. And this will also include an inspection component yep. for single family residences. So single family residents are, the use is different. It's different when a family lives there versus eight relative strangers sure. all sort of you know moving in. And so one of the things that we've heard a lot about are illegal garage conversions, yes. which uh, could be. Um, 
there could be some safety issues there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people absolutely. living in a garage with a gas water heater, <laughs> and you know, a variety of things. And so, one of the things that uh, this does include is an inspection component for single-family residential. Okay. So initially, when we talked about it, we met with. Um, the people who are in charge of uh, apartment complexes, they were sort of like, well, this inspection piece, look, we're designed to be rentals. We're designed to do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Do we really need to do this? And what was nice in those conversations that Lucas and I had with the various uh, uh, interest groups is we were able to kind of really better understand, you know, what the current situation is. Yeah. And the reality is, I think the lion's share of issues in terms of the inspection needs are around the single family residential, yeah, which are converted from one use to another. Yeah. Right. And we've actually started to see in many instances around Davis um, situations where, you know, you have a what was historically a single family residence that was a, you know, three or four bedroom house that has been carved <laughs> inside mm -hmm. into 10 bedrooms, you know, right. with t 10 to 15 and what do they students. Call them? Mini dorms? Min well, yeah. actually, the city even has a mini dorm ordinance that, yeah. uh, you know, limits on the upper end essentially around a six bedroom home, right? right. You know, but we're, what we've actually seen is illegal activity where there's these conversions so going on it. and we've yeah. had situations of up to, you know, 12 plus bedrooms in, a, in, in the same footprint of a, essentially a three or four bedroom house. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, that that's of concern. That's yeah. of absolutely serious yeah. concern. Even if even if the codes are being followed inside the house, you know, we can't have that sort of density and you can't right. have sort of, you know, t if it's a four bedroom house, you cannot have 12 bedrooms going on inside, right? You know, that's okay. just something that we've got to make sure that uh, we're, we're being attuned to both the neighbor's concerns in the community, but also landlords and also tenants and students' concerns. So trying to right. be balanced. So, um, just uh, very briefly. Concluding thoughts. Uh, <laughs> One of the things also from the neighbor's perspective is we will require that there be a local contact. So there'll be somebody within, let's call it 50 miles away, so that if there is an issue with the property, um, they'll have somebody they can contact, uh, whether that's the owner or a property management company, but right. somebody, there needs to be somebody responsible who's, nearby. So it's not in Boston, Not for just example. the absentee right. sort of, right. yeah. You know, P.O. Exactly. box somewhere in the Bahamas, right? Yeah. So. Good. <laughs> All right, so um, again, this is coming to council. Your expectation is on May 17th. That's correct. And um, if people want to get more information, I assume uh, cityofdavis.org, and there's a way to contact council members there if yes, people have absolutely. questions. Yeah. You can just kind of click on the links. I want to thank you both for coming in and talking about this. And by the way, you know, we're happy to do this, have this kind of informal discussion on any topics of oh, the sure. day with any council That's members. Great. So please consider it an open invitation. Oh, Excellent. well, thank you. Thanks so All much. Right. You've been watching in the studio here at Davis Media, Media Access. We've been talking about a proposed renter's ordinance, and my guests have been Davis City Council members Brett Lee and Lucas Frerichs. want to thank them for joining us. See you next time.